welcome. This is Psych One on One, and I'm Julianne Good. We are here to make psychology more understandable and with tips for you, your family, and friends to make your lives easier. Tonight, my special guest is Lori Morvan, and she is a wonderful musician, great blues woman. And tonight, we are going to be talking about her life and how she has integrated the blues, music, science, and just a really interesting life history. So hi, Lori. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, thank you for being here. It, it kind of took us a few weeks to connect this up, but we we did it, and here you are. And I just want to let everybody know the intro song was called Mojo Mama, and that is from your album, Lori Morvan Band, and the album is Breathe Deep. So we're going to be playing a couple of other cuts from that album tonight. So, so I'd like to start off this evening with just talking about what did you dream of becoming when you were little? You know, honestly, when I was a little girl, I thought I would grow up and become an astronaut and really was interested in, you know, science fiction. I read all kinds of science fiction books, you know, and uh, thought maybe I could go travel around the universe. <laughs> you know? I mean, really, when I was a little kid, that was definitely one of my big dreams. You definitely dreamed big, and you actually did pursue a career in aerospace, which we're going to be talking about in a little while here. But um, how did you start getting into music, and about how old were you? Well, let's see, fifth grade, so what is that, 10, I guess. Yeah, I grew up, it was just my mom and me at that time, and I grew up going to Catholic school in Joliet, Illinois, and... The, each Catholic school didn't have enough money to have their own band. And so all the Catholic schools in all of Joliet would send all their little elementary school kids down to Joliet Catholic High School. And we had one band for the entire diocese. And I learned how to play the flute. So I learned how to read music. And well, I wanted to play the drums, but my mom, <laughs> and she still laughs about this now. She thought that meant we were going to have a great big drum kit in our tiny little apartment that we lived in. And so she she said, no way, no drums. And so, you know, the flute was nice and small, and that would fit in our, fit in our apartment. So that's what I ended up uh, growing up to play. Uh -huh. uh, but, I mean, it was great for me. I, I loved playing the flute. And then as I got older and into high school band, you know, growing up in the Midwest, it's a uh, marching band is king, you know, so right. uh, during marching band season, I got to move over to the drum section because I just had some natural ability there. So I did end up getting to play the drums at least some of the time of my school band career. But so from fifth grade to 12th grade, I played the flute during concert season and then later, you know, during marching season, played the drums. So it, I had a really good, good time being in, in school band. Yeah, and and I'm also from the Midwest too. I'm from Wisconsin, so I I understand you know it those long Midwest winters when yeah. there's not a whole lot to do. So you know playing instruments is definitely an out. It's it, it's necessary to keep your sanity from keep you from you know having cabin fever all yeah. all seasons. So. Yeah, and I was in marching band too, but I was like the flag girl. You know, I wanted yes. to go and do the drums also. So you're fortunate that you did get to do that portion of it. <laughs> and in fact, interestingly enough, the very first piece of music that I ever wrote was a composition for our drum section. And I wrote it, I wrote an entire composition for every instrument, you know, snares, the tritoms, the cymbals, we had xylophones going, we had like four different sizes of bass drums going and we had, you know, all kinds of stuff. And my high school band director was cool enough to let me write this composition. And, you know, I'm not even sure how long it was. Maybe it was like a 32 bar cadence or something. And then we would use it as we'd go marching in parades, you know, in between when the band would play full songs, you know, the drums are always playing to keep the whole band marching in time. And that was our cadence for a long time. Oh, that's awesome. So, 
So how did you start going into doing sports on top of music? And how did you ever have the time to be able to do both? You know, that's an interesting question. I, I think I've played sports really as long as I can remember. I always had an interest in it as a little girl. And I was always, you know, out playing baseball with the boys. And I never in my life owned a Barbie or any, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's all good stuff, you know, but it, for me, it didn't hold any interest. I wanted to be out playing baseball or shooting a basketball or, you know, once I started playing my flute, playing my flute, I loved being in marching band. I was, you know, my parents actually, when my mom was dating my stepdad, um, I mean, they were so young. I think about how young they were. You know, I was about eight, and so they, they would have been 29. And they helped form the Junior Miss Softball League in the city of Joliet so that I could play softball because I wanted to play Little League, but at the time, girls weren't allowed to play. Mm -hmm. And so I always tease my dad and tell him he was just trying to impress my mom. So he coached my, my Junior Miss Softball team so that I could play. And I mean, that was when I was eight years old. So the first time I was in organized sports, I was eight. And then I just went from there. I never stopped playing organized sports. And as soon as I could in school, I, I started playing. When I was in seventh grade, I, I transferred to a public school for the first time after my mom married my stepdad. Mm -hmm. So I did six years of Catholic school. And then I, I transferred to a public school. And they had much better sports programs. And that's where I really kind of got to, to blossom and play organized sports. And then I just played every sport that the school that I, that I could, that they had and all that all the way through high school, et cetera. You know, I just, I loved playing and I was always a busy kid, but you know, I think that's just who I am because my adult life, I'm a busy woman. I'm just always working at something. So really, I guess that pattern was set up when I was a kid and I could always handle a heavy load and, much to her credit, my mom let me take on a heavy load and always just supported me in my efforts, you know, in the various things, sports, that's, music. Yeah, it's wonderful. And the, the whole thing, too, with the, the discipline be, between doing sports and learning music and practicing for both of them, I'm sure served you really well throughout your lifetime, correct? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think Playing a, a sport and learning to play an instrument, they both require a lot of discipline, both physically and mentally, because you're you're learning a skill and you're training, you know, your brain to take in information. One, you know, in either situation. And I was a good student too. I was kind of one of those all-around kids. I I ended up when I graduated, I was salutatory in my class and all. You know, I had a job and I just, you know, I just kind of always was able to take care of things. And, uh, in my, in my high school, you know, I didn't go to a big giant high school, you know, it's little Plainfield, Illinois, you know, so it wasn't like, I mean, my high school is probably 1200 kids. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I know there's high schools out there that have 3000 kids or whatever, but so in a, in a small town situation, I got to really blossom and, and do a lot of things. And, you know, I, I think I, I earned, 12 varsity letters when I was in high school. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I played three sports a year, all four years, and I never played a JV team. I started out as a freshman on the varsity team on every sport I did. But, you know, it, so it was just a, you know, it was a great situation for me. And my parents were just marvelous at juggling my schedule with my stepbrother and my stepsister. And they attended every game and concert. And my sister was in school plays. And, you know, my parents were really fantastic about that. Really supportive and encouraging. Yeah, that's a blessing, Lori. Yeah. Oh, it is. Right. I tell them all the time. How yeah. Awesome. I think it is. Because yeah. I knew that I, I just had the freedom to just go explore becoming the best version of me I could become. And they just said, you know, you go, girl, <laughs> you know, go. That's the best. Bang. That yeah. is the best. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So how old were you when you started transitioning into playing guitar? That was about 17 or 18. You know, in my little dinky town, we didn't have a Home Depot. You know, that was way too big city for us. But we had a little, 
we had a little home improvement store. It was called G Lumber, you know, G E E G mm. Lumber. And I had a part-time job there. It was right down the street from my home, like a mile away. And one of the guys working there was two years ahead of me in school. So I was a sophomore when I started working there. He was a senior. And we became just best buddies. And he had an acoustic guitar. And that was the first time in my life at some point, I want to say, you know, maybe it was my junior year or something where I, you know, we started hanging out a lot. And I, I, you know, he's like, oh, hey, I got this guitar. And I, I picked up that guitar and I thought, this is the best thing in the history of the world. There's nothing better than this thing that I have my hands on right now. I remember that moment. It was like a lightning bolt, you know, and I started playing guitar and never looked back. I mean, it just that it just became a huge part of my life, starting from that little instant where he just said, "Yeah, I got this guitar." <laughs> yeah, here you go. Didn't realize how life changing it would be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I really didn't. Yeah. So, how did you start getting into bands then? What 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 did the that period of around seventeen eighteen look like? Well, I really didn't start getting into official bands until later. Now, Brendan knew another kid named Joe that played guitar. So the three of us would kind of get together from time to time and, and you know, try to write songs. Well, Brendan and I actually spent a lot of time, just the two of us, trying to write songs. And, we, you know, we were just these little middle class, you know, blue collar family kind of kids. We didn't have a lot of money and, you know, we'd be like over at his house. He, there were eight kids in his family and I was like the ninth kid and like they never locked their door. It was, I mean, that's where I grew up, you know? And so I would just come waltzing in. It would just be like, oh, hi, Lori's here. And, you know, I'd go over and, you know, we had, we had this little running joke that, oh, Lori and Brendan are going to go up to his room and make beautiful music together. You know, it's a <laughs> little double on Tundra. And we just thought that was the most hilarious thing when we were 18 years old, you know. Uh-huh. And his parents were awesome, really supportive. And we'd just go, and they had no air conditioning. So this is Illinois in the summer in an upstairs room. We're sweating our eyeballs uh-huh. out. And we're like writing these songs. And we're like, oh, isn't that cool? And we'd like, recorded on a tape deck and then we we thought we were like George Martin because we, we we would take that tape deck and we would dump that into another tape deck while we sang another thing and we were like overdubbing right it was just <laughs> hilarious and we were doing it on these little tape decks and Brendan you know you know like, okay you gotta say the date and then you hear me getting irritated I'm tired of saying the date and all this is getting recorded you know it's just mm-hmm. Listen back, Brendan actually still has some of those tapes. It's just hilarious. But that's that's when I first started writing songs. You know, it was just I learned three chords and it seemed like the most natural thing in the world to just decide to start writing a song. Sure. You know, I didn't have a conscious thought of, hey, I'm going to become a songwriter. It was just I learned he taught me a couple chords on the guitar and the next thing I knew I was writing a song. You yeah. Know, as natural as could be for me. Yeah, the, the 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 lovely organic process of creating music and just having the luxury of that time, you know, when you're that age. Yeah. You oh, know, yeah. yeah. It, it, it was. It was freedom and, you know, small town Illinois. What else are you going to do in the summer? I mean, I was playing like a tournament team softball or whatever, but still, that's only going to be a couple of times a week in the summer. And I'm had my summer jobs but you know when you're a kid you're 18 years old you're full of energy and you're off doing stuff with your friends and Brendan and I would always be writing songs and playing music either at his house or my house or what it, you know those times are precious I, w- I wouldn't trade them for anything in the world it was, yeah. it was really cool yeah and it seems you know like like simplified almost but because it you know, people don't realize, I mean, in the fast-paced world right now, to just be able to have that kind of time, it's it's almost innocent and magical. Right. Well, it is. And I think, you know, as you grow into adulthood, you, you don't get to have those times as much. And, and I don't really pine for them. I'm grateful that I had them, but I, I accept that I'm never going to have that kind of unstructured freedom that I had then. Right. But I also think, it, it was a great way 
oh, how do I put this? It was really good formation for how I would approach songwriting because it's always been organic for me. I never have approached it from a, you know, how am I going to make money off of this? Although I'd like to make a lot of money off of it. I mean, don't get me wrong. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to do other things to make money. And then that kind of, of course, I'd love to, you know, have something that sold millions of copies and get a Grammy and all. I mean, that, that would all be great, but it was like the way that I, formulated writing songs back then in that organic sense is still really the way that I write them now to this day. I, I write the song because the song is in me and it's bubbling out. And I don't think about the end result. I just, I just write the song. Right. Which is nice to be able to have that freedom, not, not to get stuck in the process of what is it going to sound like at the end. You know, because that, that's where you can trip yourself up a lot. Just, you know, just letting the process happen is just, it's a wonderful thing. So we're going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to continue with your life story, um, how you ended up getting into college in aerospace. And uh, that's fascinating. So we'll be right back with Psych One on One and Lori Morvan. Therapy Cable is the missing piece in the puzzling question, what is the role of the cyber world in healthcare? Therapy Cable has created a marketplace where healthcare finally meets technology in a consumer-friendly way. We use online technology to bring together various entities of healthcare in one central place. It's easy to access from any internet platform. We provide educational videos on topics like acupressure, medicine, psychotherapy, and yoga. You can confidentially use this information in the privacy of your home. You can stay connected to the provider of your choice or even see your provider in person. Get started today at therapycable.com. And welcome back to Psych One on One with Julianne Good and Lori Morvan. We are talking about blues, love of music, and science this evening. So, Lori, the next chapter in your life involved you getting an electrical engineering degree and your pilot's licenses. So can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Sure. When I was finishing up high school, you know, becoming a junior and a senior and kind of trying to find my way, I, I remember at some point my volleyball coach coming up to me saying, you know, there are some schools interested in you and and I said, no, I don't think I'll be able to handle playing sports in college. I'm, I want to go to the U of I. I'm going to get my degree in electrical engineering, and I'm just going to have to study all the time. I won't have time for anything else. So I just put the stop to all of that. And I went off to U of I. And my freshman year, you know, it was a lot of studying. It's very competitive school. Uh, and at that time, I think it still is, it was like the number to electrical engineering school in the nation after wow. MIT, something like that. Wow. So there's people from, you know, 120 countries there or whatever it is, some gigantic statistic. And in many of my classes, it was me and 50 guys. Wow. So, you know, there was a lot of pressure. I felt a lot of pressure that I had to be successful because, you know, you're just a young kid, you're 18 years old, you're like, oh my God, I got to do well, or they're never going to let another girl in or whatever, you know. Sure. So, anyway, my freshman year, I was doing just fine. I was studying away, getting good grades, and I ended up starting to spend all these hours over at the intramural building playing basketball against the guys, just because I missed sports so much. Mm -hmm. And so, then at some point, I think my sophomore year, I just walked up to the volleyball coach. I just went to one of their games. I missed it so much. I walked up to the assistant coach after the game and just said, do you need any more players? <laughs> I still can't believe I did that. And she kind of stepped back. She was, turned out she was from California. But, you know, she's kind of stepped back and looked me up and down and said, well, you're tall. You look coordinated. Come to practice tomorrow. I'll take a look at you. And I worked out with them the rest of that year. And then over the summer, they offered me a full ride to come and play. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I got really lucky in that. Just very lucky that I got to walk on and they liked what they saw. I worked really hard for them and they saw I was a good player and I got a full ride. So that paid my way through school because I really had no idea how I was going to pay for the oh. rest of my schooling. I had spent all the money I had saved. I started working when I was 16 
I had saved and saved and saved and saved. And it, by the end of my sophomore year, all that money was gone. And I didn't live extravagantly, but it was just to pay tuition and room and board. And that was it. But then my volleyball scholarship kicked in and that covered my room and board and my lodging for the rest of my time there. And then uh, when at getting my double E, I decided I wanted to go into aerospace. So I kind of went into the, to the uh, scholarship people and I said, you know, I, I want to go into aerospace. So I think I should know how to fly. And, <laughs> And they said, well, we'll have to, yeah, I mean, that, it was a longer conversation than that, of course, but that, they said, all right, go away. Let us, you know, go through the machinations of our process and we'll see. And a week later they came back and said, yeah, we think you should know how to fly. So we're going to pay for you to have flying lessons. Oh, wow. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are a lucky woman. <laughs> I, mean, lucky. I mean, it, I was lucky in that I, I was putting it out there that I wanted it, but mm -hmm. then just immensely lucky that they they saw the value in it they're like yeah you know that's what you want to do and your scholarship is supposed to pay for your schooling so w there's an institute of aviation right affiliated with the university of illinois so we're gonna have you go through that at the same time so i was playing volleyball i was getting my double e and i was going through the institute of aviation all at the same time oh man how did you, know. you do with the pressure? I, that sounds like an extraordinary amount of pressure. Yeah, you know, I've always been actually really good with pressure. I, I, it's like I, I take on things that are big, but I know that I can do them. I, I just, I know that I can do it. It's like, I, so now what would be pressure for me is if somebody said, you have to go be a ballerina. Now that would be pressure because I know I can't do that. <laughs> so that would just be unbelievable pressure. But these other things... I just, I knew in my heart, I just, I knew I could do them and I'm, I'm good with my time. I'm also willing to work really hard and, and not, you know, I didn't party much. I, okay. So I'll admit it. Total nerd in college. I didn't have time to party. I was working all the time. Yeah. I bet. So, you know, it was volleyball. Well, you know, school first, of course, volleyball Institute of Aviation and as I had time, I was playing my guitar and writing songs. Oh, wow. And but that definitely took a back seat while I was in college. I'm not going to kid anybody that had to take a back seat. But I yeah. still, I actually wrote quite a bit when I was in school. And like the girls on the volleyball team knew my songs. And we'd like, I'd bring my guitar on our volleyball trips because, you know, I, I played Big Ten varsity volleyball. So we were traveling all over, going to all the Big Ten schools. And I'd, I'd bring my guitar and, They'd all sing the songs with me, and you know it was it was really cool. It was really innocent and fun, and I just wrote songs that meant something to me. And and I, I mean I don't even know if I remember those songs. I, it would be interesting to find a notebook of those songs, you know. Or but, somebody recorded it like your yeah. friend. <laughs> just pop yeah, one of those I, up the next time you go to Illinois. You're right. We didn't have iPhones back in those days. <laughs> Probably good, you know. <laughs> They'll pop out a, a cassette player, right? <laughs> Something really ancient. <laughs> right, yep. It was, it was cassette players. That's all you had. I mean, I remember right. when a Walkman, when the Sony Walkman first came out and you could put a tape into the Walkman and then put your headphones on, that was a big darn deal, you know, back then. I know. <laughs> Pretty innocent times, I guess. They were. Yeah, they were. Yeah, I was so, a nerdy, geeky kid, you know. So after you got done with college and graduated, and I mean, how, how many years did that take for you to do that process alone? Yeah, I, I was there for five years. Mm -hmm. I was going, doing all that, you know, it's like I have in a, it wasn't quite a double major, but it's like going, getting my double E and going through the Institute of Aviation, that's a lot of extra classes. And then during volleyball season, like I would have to cut back to 12 units because you just, you travel so much when you play a big 10 varsity sport. I mean, you just, you travel so much. I remember one of my very high level double E classes. It was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. And I had to miss like every other Friday because of traveling with the ball and sometimes every Friday. And, you know, it's really challenging 
to, you know, to keep up and to get the notes and to study on your own and, you know, all the things that you have to study on a volleyball trip and, you know, and women athletes, you know, we don't have as many professional outlets as well, especially back then we didn't. So we had to get, you know, majors. We, we couldn't just go to school as a ghost, just enough to qualify to play basketball and then go join the NBA. You know, mm-hmm. so we had to, we had to get real majors because we knew we would be doing real jobs after we were done with school. Right. And I, I think on the volleyball team, five of us were engineers. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. A couple of us were double E's. There was the mechanical and the civil. I think there was one other one that was an engineer. I mean, I think on the entire volleyball team, there might have been one PE major. Mm-hmm. Everybody else was finance or business, you know, whatever it might have been. Yeah, very left brain majors, right? Yeah. yeah. So after you graduated, uh, you went to Los Angeles, right? Did you did you get a job offer, and that's why you ended yeah. up going to LA and that right. so that that's the next chapter so what happened during that time so my senior year at u of i well my second senior year i guess so you'd call it because i was there five years but mm-hmm. my last year of school i started interviewing and when you go to the number two engineering school in the nation you know for electrical engineering companies flock to u of i to recruit a double e graduates electrical engineering graduates and especially at that time, you know, defense contracting was gigantic. They could not hire enough good engineers. So, you know, I always say I was more of a rock star when I was gra- a graduating double E from the U of I than I've ever been as a rock star, you know, in my life. <laughs> because I got flown. I was wined and dined. I had really good grades. And I was wined and dined. I was flown all over the country on job interviews. I had, I turned them down. I was starting to get afraid that I was not going to graduate because I was missing so much class to go on this job interview. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I flew out to California several times, flew down to Texas, yada, yada, all these things. So I took a job with TRW Aerospace here in Redondo Beach, Mm -hmm. Southern California. And that's what got me out here. And within like a month of getting out here, I I went to a music store and answered my first ad to join a band. I mean, I was very, very much intent on, you know, exploring my music once I got here. Right. Well, at that point, too, you must have needed the balance, you know, from, from doing so much schooling and so much left yeah. brain activity to coming in and integrating your music and to just, you know, have having that whole life balance. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was really excited about playing music. I was 23 years old. And when I left Illinois, you know, my mom's like, really? You're going 2,200 miles away or whatever it is. And I just said, oh, mom, I'm just going to go have an adventure for a couple of years. I'll be back. Well, you know, I never went back mm-hmm. because I started my life out here. And then I started my bands out here. And then... You know, it just never turned out that I went back to Illinois. But, yeah, I just think, you know, engineering is a great field. I enjoyed it. I worked with wonderful people. It was a good job. But it wasn't music. It just wasn't music. And I was an engineer for three years while I would I would just go home from work and play my guitar all night. I just, I rent, when I first came out here, I didn't know anybody. I just rented a room and a house. And I would go to TRW and be Lori the engineer all day. And then I would come home and and play my guitar all night. And, you know, I got in this band and, you know, it was just a beginning band. But interestingly enough, the bass player in that band, the very first band I was ever in, is still my bass player now to this day. He's the bass player in Lori Morgan band. Oh, yeah. 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 And that's where we met. Yeah. and, And we've been making music together ever since. Oh, that's amazing. That's, you know, that's the power of music is that when you get together with the right combination, they turn into like extended family. Oh, and yeah. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And I see how you play off of each other and just the comfort level. So, yeah. 
Yeah, we'll talk about your band in a, a little while here. Um, so you were playing like cover music for quite a while, right? You were playing oh, rock yeah. and yeah, we had definitely rock and roll, and and eventually, um, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how many iterations of bands it went through, but eventually, uh, it was me on guitar, Pat on bass, and we had a, a another buddy of ours, John, on the drums, and we were doing a power trio. So we were just doing all whatever rock and roll covers you could do as a power trio, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jimi Hendrix and Pat Benatar and Hart and um, Joan Jett and, you know, whatever songs we could do as a, as a, as a Clapton and Cream and, you know, various things. And we did bar band stuff for a long time, had a lot of fun with it. And then after three years of, being an engineer, I kind of walked into my boss at TRW, who, interestingly enough, looked exactly like the Marlboro Man. Remember the <laughs> yes. skinny, weathered kind of, you know, he should have worn a cowboy hat every day. And then he could, and he was the nicest guy on the planet. And, but I remember walking in and just saying, Bob, I'm quitting engineering. I'm going to go play music full time. And I thought he was going to fall out of his chair. And, you know, and that was the start of my serious musical career. And I, I did play full time in, uh, you know, back in those days when you were in uh, top 40 bands, we called them. Mm -hmm. and you would play five nights a week in one club. You know, the clubs, it would be a Tuesday through Saturday. You would play from nine to one thirty in that club. And then a lot of times on Sunday, Monday, you'd go off and do an off night gig, it was called, at yet some other club. And then we traveled all over California doing that. Yeah. And, and that's, that, you know, that's kind of a rough life because it's like, you know, a lot of times the bars don't pay that much money. Hopefully people tip you. So what, what kind of hardships did that cause you? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, I went from having an engineer's salary to having a musician salary. So, I mean, you know, it was like a 90% pay cut or oh. something, you know. And, I mean, it was super hard. I, re I remember saying there was a three-year period of my life where I didn't buy one new thing. Mm. I mean, not a pair of socks. I mean, not everything that I got was from a secondhand store, you know, and, or you made do, you, you figured it out. I mean, it, it was hard. That, that part was hard, but it, I got to be better really fast because I was playing four and a half hours every night at the gig. And then I'd be in my hotel room playing for like four hours a day, you know, listening to whatever music I was interested in and, and playing along, just trying, wanting to be better and better. Oh, just trying to get better, better, better. I got to be better. I need to be better. I want to be better. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that lets you improve quickly. You know, you have to have the sort of the countenance for it. Like I, I, I can sit and work on something for hours and really dig into the technique and work on it, trying to get it better. And uh, that kind of heavy duty practicing you know, paid big dividends for me. Yeah, definitely. And you had mentioned before Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah. So how did that end up influencing how you play now and how you ended up going into the blues? Yeah, once I, and in fact, it was the same guy that introduced me to the guitar, Brendan, my buddy back in Illinois. His sister, let me make sure I get this right. His sister was best friends with Chris Layton's wife. And Chris Layton was the drummer for Stevie Ray Vaughan. Mm -hmm. So Brendan, at some point, you know, I was in my, only in my 20s. At some point, Brendan said to me, have you ever heard of this guy, Stevie Ray Vaughan? And, uh, you know, I'm like, no, you know, so he turned me onto it and I listened to it and that just rocked my world like it did a lot of people. And... I turned my attention to the blues and it never wavered from that. I mean, it was just like, bam, it was like this giant magnet pulling me in. And I like, I'm very upfront. I like that modern electric rock and rollified kind of blues. And there's a lot of blues purists who, who don't like it. They only like the old school blues and that's fine. I, you know, I'm happy for them that they like that. But what gets my heart pumping is that Stevie Ray Vaughan style 
blues. It just rocked my world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he was fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. And so no I just, doubt. But, through, you know, as soon as you like Stevie Ray Vaughan, now you're going to find out about Albert King, and then you're going to go, who's this guy? And, and then you hear Albert King, and you're like, wow, no wonder Stevie likes uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan sounds like Stevie Ray Vaughan because he sounds like Albert King. And then that, then, then I, you know, you learn about Freddie King and, and BB King, even though I grew up in Illinois, I didn't know about the Chicago blues scene because I was in little dinky rural kind of Illinois. I, I didn't know about that. So, you know, it, it's like it, Stevie was my gateway drug into the blues. And, you know, th that's a, you know, that's just been a one way street for me. I just, I love that music and, and everything that I find out about it. I wish I had more hours in the day to explore all the types of blues that exist because to me, they're all exciting. Mm -hmm. I, I love them all. I love the, the high energy Stevie Ray Vaughan type blues the best. That's my favorite, but I really love all forms of the blues. I, I just think it's all interesting, fascinating. They all have their own vocabulary and technique and style. It, it's, it's really a deep, very character-filled music. Right. And I'm, I'm exploring more along the, the blues genre also because I've been listening to one of the local K-Jazz uh, station that plays nothing but the blues. And, and uh, Gary the Way Wagner, we, the Wagman, right? He, yeah, he has, yes, he has played some of your tunes on his show. Yeah. And I love that, and I get so excited when I hear him playing your music. Yeah, he's and, a good guy. He he does try to spotlight independent artists, which I think great. is really admirable because, yes. you know, the music business has changed a lot, and it's yeah. it's really challenging. And I, I appreciate Gary Wagner and, and his spotlighting the local talent, this local Southern California talent, because, you know, it, it's we're not like, local band in the sense that we're not professional we're just local to southern california and you know we we form our own labels and we get out there bands like us we're not the only ones but you know bands like that we're touring across the u.s and we we get out there and do it we just don't have a great big record label like a you know like the the pop stars have right and it it, it and it's still you know, a challenge to make it and to book the gigs and, oh, yeah. you know, so it, it, some of the old um, situations are, are still in place with trying to get your music out and trying to get gigs. So I'm going to play another cut off of your Breathe Deep album. It's called It Only Hurts When I Breathe. Love this tune. It's just very soulful. And the first time I heard this, I, it, it just, it, my, my heart just clutched. I went, oh, this is it. This is, to me, this really defines the blues. So we're going to come back after playing this. And I'd like to know what's happening with your life now, what you're touring and everything else, okay? The Chicago School of Professional Psychology offers numerous psychology, behavioral, and health-related science graduate degrees at three campuses. Los Angeles, California, including branches in Westwood and Irvine, Chicago, Illinois, and Washington, D.C., and online. The Chicago School prepares students to meet the ever-changing mental health needs of society through classroom experience and real-world training. The Chicago School Counseling Centers in Irvine and Westwood provide caring, confidential, and affordable psychological services to individuals and their families. For more information, visit thechicagoschool.edu.
Psych One on One with Julianne Good, and that was a Lori Morvan band. She's my special guest this evening, and I love that tune, especially live. It just it's it, it sends me chills. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I like when I write a song, you know, because I'm dealing with my own pain, and then I get, you know, I write, that's why I wrote it, and then I I'll I'll share it with with you know the audience at the show and people will sometimes come and tell me you know that song gets me through and then they'll describe something they're getting through and I'm just thinking man that would just knock me to my knees and the, the thought that something that I wrote born of my own pain I decided to share something and it ends up kind of being a little thing. I don't have any delusions of grandeur, but it just ends up being this little piece that maybe helps somebody deal with their pain for the five minutes they're listening to it, you know, and it just, it lets them kind of get through their day a little bit. That's just an awesome feeling. You know, it's a gift that the audience gives to me when they, when they share their stories back with me. Yeah. It's a transformative experience. It's, I, I, I call it, my favorite group therapy yeah. because it really is. Yeah. I, I know what I feel like when I'm on stage and I can look out in the audience and see tears in their eyes or they, they've been affected somehow emotionally and we're both, you know, caught in that moment together. And it's, it's powerful. It, it, you know, music just is a transformative vehicle, period, like, oh, like no oh. other. I think it's the most powerful force in the universe in terms of connecting humanity. I don't think there's anything more powerful because you don't have to speak a person's language. If you open your heart up to their music, you will feel the emotion of it. The music transcends the language barrier and you can feel their emotion and you can experience that. And, and 
you know, trying to explain it to people, you know, my time on stage is the most precious time in my life. It's this beautiful symbiosis that happens between artist and audience, and there's a giving in both directions. It, the, the cycle would be incomplete. You need, you need both directions. It's a, it's a circular flow that happens. And when everyone just opens up their heart to the music that's happening, everyone gets uplifted a little bit for that time. You know, it, it's a beautiful, really special time, and it's a, there's an intimacy involved in it. Yeah, exactly. And so what are you doing now with your music? Hi, um, what, what's your tour schedule like? Well, we're, we're, for the first time in my career, I have what's called a weekly residence where every Thursday night I play out in Palm Springs. And this is the first time that I've had that. And it's just such a blessing. I mean, you know, it, it, the, the owner of the venue called me and, and, you know, wanted me to come out and we checked it out and we played it. And then he, you know, I thought maybe we would do it once a month or every couple of months. And he was just like, I want you every Thursday. So it, it's been, it relieved a lot of booking pressure off me, quite frankly, because it's like, I have, you know, 50 gigs a year there. Just that took that pressure off just in terms of it's nice knowing I have a weekly thing going on. We, we have a trip coming up to Northern California in June, and then later in June and early July, we'll be in the Midwest again. We, we typically go on a Midwest tour every summer. And um, we had plans. We had hoped we would be touring behind a new CD, but 15 months ago, I fell and fractured my wrist mm -hmm. and had to have surgery, and I've got a I have a titanium plate and eight screws holding my wrist together. And, and, you know, fortunately this, this motion works. So I'm able to play guitar and I feel really blessed. So um, a big part of this year will be recording my sixth CD. So we're, 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 I've been writing a lot of songs. I have close to, I don't know, somewhere between 25 and 30 songs I've written. Mm -hmm. So, um, we'll have to pare that down, obviously. And uh, as luck would have it, um, my home studio where I do a lot of my overdubbing, I, I, I do, we record what are called basic tracks in a big studio with a great engineer, and we get really good sounding everything: the drums, the bass, the rhythm guitar, the you know some of my leads and uh, keyboards, and all. We get all that done, and then we we bring it home, and I do, I do my I sing my lead vocals at home, and my lead guitar parts at home. We put background vocals, all that at our home studio. Well, as luck would have it, it blew up. Oh, so no. we have we we oh. do some stuff. You know, there's some some hurdles in my way, but they're just temporary. I, I got it. You know, we got to get our studio going, and then. Uh, you know, probably within the next couple of months, we'll get busy and start working on our next CD. Mm -hmm. so, Wonderful. So I, I'm looking forward to it because it's the, the, the cuts that I'm playing off of, that's like from the 2011, correct? Yes. And yeah. So it's been a while. Well, you know, we, it was, I got quite ambitious and I, I put a CD out in 2007. I put the next one out in 2009. I put the next one out in 2011 and we were touring heavily. I also, you know, I teach, I got a, a, a day gig I'm still juggling, you know, to bring money in and put a roof over my head. And, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, it was very ambitious. And quite frankly, I was exhausted. By the end of 2013, I was just pooped. Mm, yeah. Things are getting harder to get. The touring is just getting outrageously expensive. Hotels are unbelievable. And, you know, the gig pay... Ooh, it's just, you know, while, um, you know, expenses for everything else has gone up, band pay has either stagnated or actually gone down. Mm. And it is harder and harder and harder and harder on musicians who are trying to tour. You know, unless you're like buddy guy, you know, I mean, you know, those guys make a lot of money, but, you know, the rest of us are just scrambling right right and and you know the, the population changes and it's not right or wrong i don't judge people for it but you know it's an interesting thing where people will 
you know, spend five or six bucks on a cup of coffee at Starbucks, but they'll like balk at spending 10 bucks to see a band when you have five professional musicians on stage for three hours and they've spent 30 years getting as good as they're going to spend 10 bucks, you know? So that doesn't mean they're evil. It's just that people's tastes are changing and, and, you know, we as musicians have to be nimble and, and, and figure out how we can navigate through this kind of uncharted territory. Right. Well, yeah. And then so many people, as you'd mentioned, want their music for free now, but they don't realize the cost, as you'd said, of, uh, you know, getting to where the musicians have gotten to and how much blood and sweat and time and, and, patience and practice and everything else that goes into it but yet they demand we want this but we want it for free you can't get that yeah it's It's, it's a really interesting thing and and i think people they're not being mean they just there's a lot of well well first there's a lot of musicians who do give their music away for free yes and so then I, i and i think that it does start setting up a, just like there's a lot of musicians who will work cheap and heck I've worked cheap in my life. We've all done it. Right. And at some point you kind of draw a line in the sand and you say, okay, I just, I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. But it means you're going to work less, you yeah. know, because it's harder to find those better paying gigs. So you have to accept that as part of it. And you're working even harder trying to get the better gigs. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's like you go into a studio. I mean, all people would have to do if they ever wanted to think about how much money musicians have to spend making a real record. I'm not talking about something you made at home on the free software you downloaded from heaven only knows where. Right. But, you know, call up a a professional studio in your town and you start finding out it's $150 an hour plus the engineer and, you know, a band is in there for days or weeks or whatever it is. I mean, you know, we can't give it away. Right. It's expensive. It's very expensive. Yeah. Record. And, and, you know, I have to say, though, there is a core group of people that get it. You know, people do get it. And, and I refuse to just give my music away for free. For free. I mean, right. I, I'll have people who will just be like, well, can't you just give me a CD or whatever? You know, and I'm just like, unless you're my mother, no. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, Sorry. You know, this has value. To me. <laughs> if it doesn't have any value to you, that's okay. You know, you don't, I don't expect everyone in the world to value my music, but I'm certainly not going to hear you say, well, I don't value your music, so therefore can I have it for free, you know, or <laughs> whatever it might be. And talking about that, as we're wrapping up, can you let everybody know how they can go on to iTunes and buy your yeah. albums, right? Uh, you Please. Know, the, probably the best place, the, the best way to start would be to go to our website, and from there, you can get to all of our connections, whether it's Facebook or iTunes or whatever. Um, let me see. Here we go. Ah, here we go. Look at how handy is that? There you go. Excellent. Yes, you are prepared. I love it. <laughs> so please, everybody, go to Lori's site. Listen to her music. Pay for it. Download it. It's awesome. I have... You know, look on her website for where she is touring. She's fabulous. Her and her band in concert. That is the the, the best experience. You will have so much fun and you will just fall in love with Lori and her band. They're just wonderful people, wonderful musicians. And I'm really, really honored to know you and your band. And can you just talk about your band just really quick as we got about a minute left? Yeah, sure. Um, I have a bass player, a pretty boy, Pat Morvan. My drummer is Lonnie Jones, keyboardist Tommy Salyers, and background singer Lisa Morvan. And they're and all, wonderful. They're, we're a little family, and we have a great time playing music together. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on, Lori. It was great to see you. And when is your, your next local gig happening? Well, we're trying to get something going in Long Beach, but boy, that's proven to be difficult. But so we're playing our weekly shows out in Palm Springs. And right now that's the closest we're getting to Southern Cal, unfortunately. So if anybody knows anybody that can get us hooked up in uh, the greater L.A. area, find me on my website.
Help me. I, I, I just may, <laughs> might be able to call you on that one. So <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Okay. <laughs> All right. Because I want to I want to see you again locally. It, it, it's been a few uh, months. So, okay. yeah. Excellent. So thank you so much, Lori Morvan. It was fascinating. It's really good to let everybody know how hard it is to be a professional musician nowadays. You know, and, and the combination of science and music is so important. I think that's what they're forgetting in our local schools nowadays is, is that music does help your brain to learn more hard sciences. So hopefully people will start listening to that. So anyways... Thank you so much for being with me on Psych One on One. My name is Julianne Good. Please join us. And we're putting out new new shows like about twice a month. So, And please check out the rest of our interesting, fascinating shows on WePlayRadio.com. So thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Bye now. Mm-hmm.